Dolberg. Okay, Attorney Dolberg. Good morning, and may it please the court. Nancy Dolberg for Shandell Retiri. Before I proceed, I just want to indicate that I, for the sake of clarity, because this can be a confusing fact pattern, I will, consistent with my brief, use the last names of individuals, no disrespect intended to any individual. Um, I am asking that the court vacate all of the convictions in this case except count 12, missing, misleading the police, and ask the court to enter not guilty on that count. This case presents the kind of factual scenario for which the rule in adjutant and its progeny was developed. We're self-defense, and we argue here, defense of another, and I will just, without trying to confuse the court, indicate that the Commonwealth has assumed that defense of another applies here in this case. Where, where self-defense and defense of another are asserted by the defendant, and there is a dispute as to who escalated a conflict with the use of deadly force, Evidence that an alleged victim was a first aggressor initiating prior acts of violence, even if unknown to the defendant, can help the jury determine the truth of what happened. Evidence that Griffiths was the first aggressor with a knife in a prior incident was excluded by the judge here, and that exclusion was prejudicial error requiring a new trial. Here, everyone agreed that there was a melee among four people that lasted a very short time. However, there was a dispute as to who initiated the use of deadly force with the knife. All four participants sustained injuries. Griffith said he had no knife and that Ritteri was the aggressor. But Ritteri said that Griffiths had a knife. Counsel, and as can I ask you a question? Yes. Uh, one of the reasons or one of the bases that we uh, relied upon in expanding uh, the rule that is now the adjutant rule was the fact that uh, there, all the federal courts allowed that kind of um, propensity evidence in. I think it was 45 out of the 50 states also allowed it in for uh, the, the self-defense. Have you done um, or do you know whether uh, the federal uh, courts do allow um, this kind of propensity evidence in for defense of another? and or the states? So the majority of states do not have the adjutant rule. The majority of states, like the federal government, and there is a footnote in adjutant, and, and actually in the brief I can point you to, but um, they allow propensity evidence as to reputation, not as specific acts of violence. Right, so that's, that's a different question. The, the, the question I had is for the sort of basic proposition of allowing propensity evidence, regardless of its reputation or specific acts. Yes. In adjutant, it seemed that one of the persuasive things that, uh, one, one of the things that was persuasive to the court was the fact that the states had actually already gone that way, as had the federal government. So. United States versus Kaiser, which is cited yeah. by adjutant and which is cited in the brief, uh, includes defense of another. And now is that's, that the only case that you're aware of? You know, there are not very many cases of defense of another. So yes, I don't have other cases that, that talk about that. But there are remarkably few cases that involve defense of another generally. Can I ask you to explore the differences between self-defense in defense of another vis-a-vis -vis the adjutant rule? Because in a straightforward self-defense, we'll look into see who the first aggressor was. Was it the victim or the defendant? Mm -hmm. Now we get defense of another, and it's a third person, of course, the other being thrown into the mix. And it becomes, it seems to me, a bit more convoluted because we're looking at perceptions of, is it who was the first aggressor on whose perception? Was it the person who was the other? Or is it someone perceived by the defendant? Or how does that work? And how would you compare the two? Well, if I may talk about this specific case, I would say the evidence is the same on defense of another and self-defense. I'm just wondering about the rule, though, because the more it gets, the more we move from self-defense to defense of another and a different person is put into the mix. Um, does the propensity argument, and it, does it become somewhat more convoluted and confusing to the jury? Well, I, I can spin out some hypotheticals if you don't want me to talk about this specific case. No, no, please. Well, answer, in this answer, spe answer it how you want to. All right, let me start with this specific case. In this specific case, the evidence was the same. Miss Rattieri saw 
according to his statement, heard Griffiths stabbing his co-defendant. And for the sake of clarity today, I will say co-defendant. That, that is Mr. Rios Figueroa, Figueroa, but because I have difficulty with that name, I'm going to say co-defendant. Um, so he, he hears him stabbing, he hears the co-defendant yelling out, and at that time, this melee, which people, the testimony is people are right on top of each other, caused him to fear for his own life and for his co-defendants, and he says that in his statement. So in that case, the situation is the same. The first aggressor is Griffiths and causes concern about self, raises the defense of self-defense in defense of another. Um, if Your Honor is discussing a situation, and so I think the court can certainly say, in this scenario, defense of another clearly applies. We, we have the footnote in the case that says this only applies, doesn't apply to self-defense, the defense of another. So I know it, you dispute that, but there's, there's at least a footnote that says that. There right? is a footnote in Camacho that says we are not going to extend the rule to defense of another in this case. Right, and I'm just wondering what the logic is, and, and is it because it becomes more convoluted when we move from self-defense to defense of another? Well, I therefore more more confusing to the jury. I and I would just say that Camacho didn't raise the issue, and so I think that the statement there was dictum and also limited by in this case. I would say that there is no additional. Oh, I'm sorry. But it does raise the issue of Camacho. It just it distinguishes it on the facts, doesn't it? Camacho is is not about. Um, there was no dispute in Camacho about who initiated uh, force. It was the defendant shot a, a gun into the crowd. There was absolutely no evidence of a dispute, the uh, as a dispute as to first aggressor. So I, it appears that that was. Dictum, and, and actually, I reviewed the briefs in that case. The only mention, there, there was no argument on either side. There was just an assertion that it should apply. So I would say that truly this court is not bound by that, and there is no reasoned argument for that. Um, and I would also, but I do want to, I don't know if I answered Judge Siscaziano's question, so I don't want to, is that... Is that what? I was just trying to understand what happened in Camacho before you got to the. Because in, in, in defense of another, there really are two different assaults. One is the assault between the victim and, and the third party, correct? Mm -hmm. Then there's the a, a, a attack or self defense by defendant against victim. So I'm just want to explore how um, how this. That's just an issue applies to this, this scenario. So to the current scenario, I would say that they're, the two are linked just as they are sort of inextricably tied in case law. As to a hypothetical where uh, someone was across the street and had had an argument and then there was someone else attacking a third party, uh, I think it, it'd still be applicable. But remember that adjutant evidence is within the discretion of the judge. Here, the judge abused that discretion because he thought he couldn't exercise it. He did not understand for some reason the language of the of Rituri's statement, for, which I don't really frankly understand. I think it's pretty clear that Griffiths was the first aggressor and that was corroborated by the statement of the co-defendant. But I could, I think that that, your, your question, Your Honor, I think it should be I, I'm asking the court to rule that it's admissible, but certainly within the discretion of the trial court, and perhaps they would see in that situation it didn't fall, it didn't justify admission. Here, if, if adjutant is a discretionary doctrine, which, I, which it is, mm -hmm. as you stated, and the judge here exercised his discretion to exclude the um, prior act, even though self-defense was also a defense in the trial. Even if we were to agree with you that the doctrine um, adjutant should be extended to defense of another cases, how would that affect the outcome in this case? Because we know that the judge excluded the evidence as a discretionary matter, even though self-defense was a defense. So the judge was prepared to admit the evidence. He indicated that clearly. He said it was relevant and temporarily related. He decided later that the record did not indicate that Griffiths was, that there was evidence that Griffiths was the first aggressor and that was in dispute. 
that is indisputably wrong. And I think what happened here and the reason it's error and abuse of discretion is that the judge did not recognize that he had the ability to admit it because he did not recognize the dispute. So but I was... How, how, how can we reconcile that with the fact that he gave a self-defense instruction? Because he gave a self-defense instruction, which would only make sense if, if there was evidence that Griffiths was the first aggressor. I agree with you, Your Honor. I, it's, it's inconsistent. And well, another indication that he was wrong. Well, perhaps he just... Perhaps we're giving too much weight to what he said when he said there was no evidence, because clearly by the time the instruction comes along, he's thinking there is sufficient um, evidence to support giving the instruction to the jury. For most of the jury, and if for much of the transcript, he's very clear that he's going to admit it. And then one day he looks at the transcript of the of Rattari's statement and says, "Well, I don't see where the dispute is," and the you know, the, the defense attorney knows that there's a dispute. He says, hey, this is what happened. And I, you know, I have that in the brief, but for some reason the judge didn't recognize it. And that was error. And, but I agree that it's a real inconsistency and in, with his instruction. And so in, in your view, since it is a discretionary decision, what are the factors that should be taken into account when the judge is exercising that discretion? Well, I think as laid out in Adjutant and his progeny, the, uh, here he considered prejudice versus probity, and the Commonwealth argued against the admission of the Griffiths evidence because he said it was very prejudicial to their case, which sort of supports our argument that the exclusion was very prejudicial to Ritteri. So prejudicial versus probative, relevance, and temporally related. And then the issue is how much of it comes in. That's a discretionary matter for the judge. But the judge actually exercised discretion appropriately until he got to a reading of the transcript that at that time just escaped him. He, he doesn't exercise discretion here, right? He says if if someone's going to extend adjutant to defense of another, it has to be the SJC. He can't do it. So he doesn't. He doesn't exercise. No, as to defense of another, absolutely, Your Honor. I think as to self-defense, it was an error in the exercise of discretion. And as to uh, defense of another, he was unwilling to indicate that it applied. And yes, and he pointed to, of course, the SJC on that issue. Justice Wolohotin, did I answer your question? You did, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other questions on that issue? Should I carry on? And, oh, I don't have a lot. Okay. Rest in this reading, because I, I had a little trouble following your argument about the time. It's the first time they interview your client. It's at 7 o'clock in the morning. They haven't discovered the gun on the beach yet at that point. So isn't he misleading the police when he says, I didn't go to the beach? He said, I don't, I believe he said, I don't think I went there. But to go back for a minute, the Commonwealth has to prove that, um, that, let me just get the language here. The Commonwealth has to prove that um, he caused, caused the police to pursue a course of investigation materially different from the course they would have, could have, did, or could have. The Commonwealth failed to prove this because they knew at 3 o'clock in the morning that he threw the knife into the water. That was, on, that was in real time on the video. And they have not proven that they could have been misled by that. Do they know it's him at 3 o'clock in the morning? The police officer who saw this in real time said they, they already had the description of the, his car. They said that, and he had already gotten the bolo. I haven't seen this video, but is this video clear that it's him and his car, or is it going to be one of these grainy videos that we always get? The police off the Yarmouth police officer who testified indicated that he got the bolo, the car looked like a silver, a light car, and the man looked like a black man. This was the definition, this was the, the description that came over the bolo. He says he didn't go to the beach, and we have that level of detail, he's not misleading the police. He said, I don't think... Because a black man was driving a, a, a gray car to the beach. I think if they, they, they knew it was what had happened because they sent the police there in the morning to go retrieve it from the 
from the ocean. But they had a bolo go out just before 3 a.m. And at 3.02, they see in real time someone matching that. That's why he immediately contacted the Barnstable police with the information. So are you saying that when um, the defendant made the misstatement to the police, they already, those particular officers already knew uh, that he had discarded the knife? They, w they certainly have not proven otherwise, and it's the burden of proof. They had all the information to show that they had and that they, they had proffered no evidence that they could have been misled. I would like to just say his misstatements, I say, were equivocations, and they're distinguished from the kinds of statements uh, that in, as I describe in the brief. The only case you cite, though, is the case where the person eats the drugs in front of the cops. That's are there any places more like this where the statements are misleading, but the cops are So I would definitely, I would um, distinguish the two cases that I have in the reply brief that the Commonwealth relies on, both cases in which the police did not know the truth of a situation at the time that they were doing in their investigation and found out later. And uh, so there aren't, again, a lot of cases in this area but the ones that are relied upon are different. Counsel, I want to ask about what our inquiry is here. Um, we have previously, just to quote the Paquette case that you, mm -hmm. um, that you cite in your brief, that the test is whether these are lies that reasonably could lead investigators to pursue a materially different course of investigation. So that sounds like an objective inquiry about the nature of the defendant's statement. Is it of the kind that reasonably could lead investigators to pursue a materially different course of investigation? You have briefed this as a question of whether, given what the officers subjectively knew at that time, whether or not those officers, in fact, could be misled. Which is it? The, the Commonwealth has to show that they could have been misled. And... I would hear they have not presented any evidence, any evidence that they could have been misled. In addition, I would just go back to the, in terms of the equivocations that I don't know, that is actually not considered a misstatement under the case law. Did I answer your question, Justice? So is it, is it one or the other or is it both? So what, if, if, a, if, a, if a, a person who's the subject of investigation uh, tells a blatant lie to an officer that could mislead them. For example, um, oh, I saw who did it. It was John Jones. But that officer subjectively knows that actually mm -hmm. the person who says that did it. Uh, does that not satisfy the statute because the officer couldn't be misled? I think if, he, if the officer knows at the time then he could not have been, then he cannot be misled. So, so that people have an ability to lie to police officers as long as those police officers have information that, that would counter the lie? Well, if they know that it's, it, it's information that would not miss, and of course it's the Commonwealth's burden. If they have information that would, could not mislead them because they know the truth, then it's not the crime of intimidation of a witness, class misleading the police officer. That's what I would say. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Attorney L. Corey. Good morning. May it please the court, Roselle and L. Corey for the Cape and Islands District Attorney's Office in the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth contends that the trial judge's denial of the defendant's motion to admit first aggressor evidence pursuant to Commonwealth versus Adjutant 443 Mass 649 2005 was an appropriate exercise of his discretion. Whether to admit evidence of prior violent incidents instigated by the victim of a crime is, quote, always subject to the broad discretion afforded to the trial but he, judge. But here the, the judge didn't, the judge read our footnote and said, I don't have the discretion, right? Uh, that's correct. And the Commonwealth, although in our brief we do treat arguendo uh, defense of another as if it were uh, self-defense just for the, for the purposes of the argument, does maintain that it was not an abuse of discretion for the judge to decline to unilaterally. Well, well let me ask you, um, what's the distinction between defense of another and self-defense such that we should have different attitude rules? 
I would say that the distinction boils down to the complications in a fact pattern. Uh, with self-defense, the threat is clearly an immediate threat. Uh, an individual is responding to the, the overt acts of supposedly a, a victim who is an aggressor. Whereas for defense of another, that is inherently less uh, immediately clear. It's a, it's a perceived threat and attack. Um, now, granted, where deadly violence is involved, that does become a little bit more straightforward. If you have one person who's wielding a weapon and one who doesn't, there is a much clearer disparity there for a third party. But I, I would say that the distinctions come in terms of the complications. That's the case, though. Why shouldn't the defendant have the benefit of the evidence, the, the adjutant evidence? In this particular case, I would say that the defendant should not have the benefit of it because neither defendant uh, or the co-defendant in this case ever admitted to utilizing deadly force in any way. You know, the defendant is very specific in his language when he talks about self-defense or when he talks about what he did. He says, maybe I hit him. He clearly, you know, uh, watching the video, there, there are moments where he uh, gesticulates in a way that indicates stabbing. He knows the difference between stabbing and hitting. He knows when he says hitting what he's saying. Um, there is no uh, indication on his part or on the part of the co-defendant that either of them used a knife at any time during this altercation. But if we, when we're analyzing whether you get an instruction, we look at the facts in the light most favorable to the defendant, not to the constable. We look at these facts in the light most favorable to the defendant. It, it's clear that, that there's two knives in place here. It's absolutely, I and mean, for an instruction, that is correct. But this is not an instruction. This is the admission of evidence uh, where this is less clear. This is not going to assist the jury in understanding the circumstances of this fight. It is just going to add layers of confusion. Uh, but correct me, I thought the lens we looked at on adjutant is still on the light most favorable to the defendant. Uh, it was my understanding that it still boils down at the end of the day to the discretion of the judge. Right. Uh, right. And it's, it's the discretion of the judge after they analyze the evidence that's been broadly introduced in the light most favorable to the defendant. And looking at it in that light, from the beginning, the judge made very clear that this, this incident he felt was proper adjutant evidence if it was warranted by the situation. Um, but given the way the case developed, given the evidence that was put forth, it was not appropriate to put in adjutant evidence where neither defendant was at all indicating uh, a but use that, But that does not necessarily square with the defendant's statements, right? Because, you know, when you, when you listen or when you read the defendant's statements to the police, he talks about this, it's not long, but there is a break between his involvement in the melee and then having an opportunity to look at what his co-defendant and the other two involved. And he very distinctly says, you know, that the woman was on top of him and he was being called out for by his co-defendant. And, and not only called out for, but saying, he's poking me, he's sticking me. So isn't, this, isn't the factual circumstances here in the light most favorable to the defendant there? In the light most favorable to the defendant, I would say yes. Um, I would, however, say that, again, it, it doesn't quite reach there. I, I genuinely think that where neither defendant is willing to make any sort of statement saying this is, this is the level of force with which um, we addressed this situation, that... So we needed, we needed Rattery to say, so I then got this knife and stabbed the, the victim because I had to do that in order to defend. We need to finish the other part of the equal sign. I would say yes. I would say if you look at the other cases in the adjutant line, there aren't any that I'm aware of. And admittedly, my, my knowledge is not completely extensive. I don't extensive. really understand that, counsel. Why does the defendant have to admit using the knife when the evidence read in the light most favorable to him in terms of the adjutant um, analysis suggests that he did. That we know that he um, discarded a knife. Uh, we know that the victim was stabbed multiple times. 
Uh, there were two knives used in the incident. Why wouldn't all of that evidence suggest that the adjutant analysis would favor uh, giving, uh, allowing the propensity evidence? I would say because it actually leads to a scenario similar to the one that we have right now, where a defendant makes equivocal statements and refuses to, uh, for lack of a better phrase, take ownership of the self-defense or defense of another uh, that they engaged in, and now comes afterwards saying, well, but. Um, I think that where a defendant does not uh, indicate in any way that uh, they participated in the in the. Uh, well, he admits he participated in the melee. He just right. says, "I was helping my friend who was on the ground being stabbed." He does, but he, when he's not admitting to utilizing the same degree of force uh, that allegedly uh, was used by multiple parties in the in the fight. What's your best case for that, that the defendant has to admit using deadly force? Uh, I would actually say that I think the fact pattern in chambers is very illuminating. I think it does a good job of showing a defendant who there was a struggle over that knife, and the defendant says, I don't know if I, you know, twisted it and stabbed it. You know, he gives uh, conflicting accounts, but he does say that, yes, there was a knife. I did try to take control of it. I did take these actions that did result in this stabbing. Here, neither defendant says that they took any actions that just, that resulted in anybody stabbing. This seems a little weird to me because, put otherwise, I think your argument sounds, your argument sounds to me as though you're saying the defendant needs to admit to the crime with which he's been charged by the government in order to have the benefit of, an, of the defense or the adjutant evidence. I can understand that interpretation. Uh, it's my thought that the purpose of adjutant, it, self-defense is to a degree and admission of committing the crime of which one is accused, but it's saying that this this crime that I committed was justified because of these circumstances. But that's, that's never been the law that a defendant has to admit or get on the witness stand to get a self-defense. You can ha you can raise self-defense through ancillary evidence that does not involve any admissions of uh, misconduct by a defendant. Correct? Yes, but where the argument I feel was that this, you know, the defendant never had a knife in his hand. I don't, I don't think that the, the judge... The issue is where the facts and circumstances give rise to, in a light most favorable to the defendant, a self-defense. And now the issue is whether or not facts and circumstances in a light most favorable to the defendant give rise to an adjutant, um, admission of adjutant evidence. Uh, <coughs> I'm, I'm not going to disagree with Your Honor on the... On well, the right, we're trying to flesh this out because on one hand, it sounds like... Uh, you, you want it both ways, because on the one hand, you seem to be suggesting that the defendant has to make this allocution in order to get the benefit of it. But on the other side, we don't get to take anything into the fact that you charged them with misleading the police for throwing away a knife. Right. So so you're you're charging him consistent with that. He used something in this. Uh, but yet, on the other hand, uh, you're saying, but we don't know whether he actually used anything in this. It's, I wouldn't say that I'm saying we don't know whether he used anything in this. Clearly, from the Commonwealth's position, it's very clear who used certain utensils during this. this uh, so why does he have to admit it? I would say that that's, that is to a degree what self-defense required, particularly in a case like this where the issue is not of who the first aggressor of the actual entire fight was, but it's who, who initiated the escalation. Mm -hmm. Where the issue is escalation and where neither the defendant nor the co-defendant wants to be anywhere near an admission uh, to participating in an es escalated level of violence. I would say that in that case, how, how, do, you, how do you reach... Uh, that they acted in uh, defense of another in a way that resulted in the results that we that we have. But wouldn't in that case this be the kind of evident case where adjutant evidence would actually be really helpful to the jury? Uh, in this case, I 
in this particular case, um, it's my position that it would not. Um, one of the concerns that the court had at the initial um, decision in adjutant was the opportunity for uh, arguments to devolve into an, exam an examination of collateral events. And as the Commonwealth made clear at the, at the um, time of the trial, there was a full intent to bring in more evidence of specific acts of violence on behalf of the defendant and co-defendant as rebuttal evidence. That was never fully reached and never fully discussed because the defendant's uh, adjutant evidence never came in. But I would say that the direction based, you know, a reading of the transcript, a reading of the, um, of the facts of this case makes it clear that there is a good chance this would have devolved into a trial within a trial, for lack of a better phrase. Can I move to the misleading of police well, officers? Oh, one question for you. You don't, you, Camacho is your best case, but you don't talk about it at all. Do you want to take a shot at saying that, explain to us why Camacho would support the judge's decision here? Uh, I think. Can you explain factually why it's similar to this? Uh, well, at the outset, the, sim the, the easiest similarity between Camacho and uh, this case is that in both cases, there was no question about who started the fight. Um, the question in this case came uh, in the context of who escalated. Uh, and in Camacho, that was less of an issue uh, than it was here. Uh, but similar to Camacho, there were periods of disengagement and re-engagement as uh, there were alleged to be in this case. But in the footnote of Camacho, where we say we don't apply it, we're not going to extend action in this case. We're, we're clearly drawing some kind of distinction. You want to argue why it helps you? Because your, your factual argument seems incredibly weak, uh, and you're not taking on the legal argument. Uh, the, the issue in Camacho where there are multiple, for lack of a better phrase, I'm sorry, moving parts, uh, is something that the court makes very clear. These be end up becoming uh, very collateral and they are of minimal relevance to uh, making a determination about who, who took what actions. I think... Um, the language that the court ultimately uses is that um, the primary question for the jury was not who began the altercation or escalated it to deadly force, but rather whether the defendant was legally entitled to use the force that he used. Um, and I would say in this case, it is, it is similar in that regard. Ultimately, the question for the jury was less about who started it and whether or not that the, whether the actions taken uh, by the can I ask you, just to clarify, Camacho, the victim did no part in the fight, right? Had no part in the fight. Yes. Right. And here, uh, the victim was part and parcel of the fight. Yes. Okay, so that seems to be a difference. Um, that is a not insignificant difference. I think uh, the parallel comes more from the fact that the defendant in that case sought to introduce evidence of uh, prior specific instances of violence on behalf of individuals who are not the victim uh, to, to justify the actions that were ultimately taken. Uh, and in that way, I would say that that, um, that concern that you're going to start bringing in and expanding uh, to things that are really ancillary, I would say in that way does sort of parallel this case. Can you um, go um, over the uh, fact, the timing of when the police knew what about the knife and the discarding of the knife at the beach? Uh, sure, happy to do my best, uh, but I do see my time is up. Um, so during the initial interview uh, that the police had with the defendant, which took place, I believe, uh, between, uh, I wanna say 7.30ish in the morning, 7.50ish uh, in the morning, uh, the defendant denied going down to the beach or the ocean. And at that time, did the police know that in fact he did? The police knew that a person matching the defendant's description had been down at the beach. I apologize off the top of my head. I can't remember if they had uh, specifically identified the defendant as the individual. But what is known is that they did not identify what 
they did not know exactly what he had done at the beach. It looked like he had thrown something into the water, but whether he actually had done so and what he may have thrown into the water was still not yet known. Um, and, and did the defendant make any statements about the object, the knife? Uh, once shown a picture of the knife, he said, that's my knife. He did admit that that knife belonged to him. What was the misleading part? Sorry. Uh, the misleading part would have been when he said, I didn't go down to the ocean. I wasn't anywhere around. But there. at that time, they knew he had been at the ocean. They knew someone matching his description had been um, down at the ocean and had thrown something into the water. But that denial of even being present there was clearly intended to lead the police in a different, oh, it wasn't me. So anything you're looking for is not going to be related. Can we just go to exactly what he said? So in the interview, he repeatedly said that he was, quote, sauced up and repeatedly denying, denied memory of the entire period of time. And that had occurred numerous times. And then they asked, did you go to the water tonight? Did you go down by the water, by the ocean at all? Down by the ocean? Yeah. Down by the ocean. Down by the ocean? No. The beach? I don't, or anything like that? I don't remember. You don't remember? I don't think so. I don't think so. So he is pressed and he says, I don't remember, I don't think so, I don't think so. Um, at one point he does say, down by the ocean, down by the ocean, no. So what is your best case for the proposition that den just denying a police accusation in this manner where you're sort of pressed and you say, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't think so, counts as willfully mis misleading a police officer in a way that, uh, I forget the exact language of the statute, but that um, uh, willfully, with the intent, impede, obstruct, delay, and so forth, um, an investigation. Uh, I would say the best case probably is Paquette, which is 475 Mass 793. Um, Specifically, if you look at uh, page 798, it discusses that the definition of mislead includes knowingly making a false statement, um, which, yes, is, is a broad category, but uh, it does, the defendant's actions in this case do fall under that umbrella. Um, equivocations aside, he does at times make very clear, it's not me, I wasn't there. Well, can we put the equivocations aside? Like where, where do you, would you say is the unequ most unequivocal false statement here? Uh, sorry, bear with me, let me get to the page. It's um, R65 is the part that I was quoting. It's embarrassing, my computer is now being difficult, it's decided right now is the time it wants to give me a hard time. Um, I would say the, the unequivocal no in his first response. Um, the initial statement that I did not go down to the ocean. Um, you know, he does then say, well, I, I don't remember, but his initial response is no, it wasn't me, I wasn't there. So I would say that's probably the strongest statement for the misleading. Can I ask about the, are you done, sir? Can I ask about the lesser included? Uh, there, there's not, the, the different stabbings and beatings are not separately identified in the counts. Uh, uh, how can we save these things individually based on the fact there are multiple incidents when the jury is not instructed, nor is the defendant charged specifically? Um, I would say that the testimony of the doctors in the case did sort of make clear that there were different... But the jury doesn't, the jury is directed to that. Don't we have to find these are lesser included? Um, potentially, it's the Commonwealth's position that there was enough of a distinction that a jury could understand, you know, different instances, different uh, potential avenues. Was it argued that way? In closing. Not, not as clearly as it could have been. Um, but I would say that uh, to direct your attention to uh, volume 11 of the transcript, I believe page 69, the parties do, uh, during the motion for required finding of not guilty, touch upon the issue of duplicativeness. And they do appear to not quite come to a consensus, but acknowledge that there are multiple avenues to reach the convictions that uh, on, the, on the charges that the defendants face. 
in the closing, the prosecutor doesn't walk through the different ones, right? There's no, there's no attempt to differentiate by count, right? It's not to my memory. I don't think it's there's a clear walkthrough in closing. 